That's good. Perfect. So here we have Phil Hello. Clark Hello. and he's got his Genie Race 5, Genie, uh -huh. Genie Race 5 with his Gin Boomerang 12. Phil's a lot more active in the comp scene than I've been for some time. So Phil's gonna talk you through and give his first impressions of the Genie Race 5. I noticed you wrapped the glider around the harness, is that yeah, normal? Yeah, it goes around the, the top end. So I've got the, the bottom of the bag here, top of the bag here, and then the, the leading edge comes in behind the, the foam and the structure on the underside of the harness, flat on the back, and then comes around the top. Um, and because it's the extra, extra extra large bag, it's the freakish enormous hidey body in it bag, um, <laughs> you can fit the glider in with just one fold because it's only a two meter cord. Mm -hmm. So you've got a meter of harness and a two meter cord and the glider just comes around the, the top. That's the easiest and sort of kind of best way of protecting everything. Um, you don't want to squidge the foam too much. This is just foam. There's a hard plastic thing in there. So that's kind of got to sit flat in the harness. Um, and then the rest of the harness structure is kind of all in here. Um, and it all kind of goes fairly flat, but because it's got the coiroid, you can't bend it in the middle. Um, so it's got to be flat in one piece. So kind of having the cone on the seat and then the rest of the harness kind of in the top section and then the glider goes around and it, it just kind of works. But the, the most obvious thing to notice is the, the size of the tail. I mean, the structure on the inside is broadly similar, just in terms of like the seat, the black, the yeah, plates on the, the side. Race four. Yeah, compared to the race four. But it misses the, the get up reminder. So you gotta be really careful about clipping your legs in when you, you first put the harness on. Um, and then, yeah, and then the tail. The tail is freakish enormous. Um, but super keen to get inflated. I mean, this is just the, the wind blowing up the hill that's doing this. Um, so it's not hugely breezy, it's like 10 to 12 mile an hour. Um, but yeah, the, the tail's keen to come up, should we say, which is uh, something I struggled a bit with the race for. So it took a while to find the secret and get that right. So this is the only sort of fiddly part. The pole's got to go in the pocket. And on the race for it, it's just a stick, whereas this is a much wider kind of plate and batten. So it's a bit harder to kind of shoehorn that in. There's been a couple of changes from the or original videos to uh, the finished version. So they've obviously tweaked a couple of things on the way. And one of the things they tweaked was the, the video at the, the, the zip at the, the foot end of the pod. There we go, right. No, it's a little bit. I found a bit of a fiddle to get in as well, but I guess yeah. got it, it's got to fit really tight. Isn't yeah, it? it's, it's got to go. So once it's in, and you just keep pushing and pushing and pushing until you get that defensive resistance. You can see it's there at the bottom of the pocket, and you know it's not going to go any further. I think on the first version of the harness, there was a possibility to put it in at the back and it would come right the way out yeah. the bottom. So that's something they've changed. So they're obviously still making small tweaks as production goes on. So the important bit is just having the, the string on the inside because of the way it's all, it's all rooted. But I think it's one of those things that, you know, when you do this 10, 20, 30 times, it, it gets just that little bit looser and easier to go in. Yeah, it's like a new pair of trainers. Yeah, it's going to be a, a little bit stiff initially. Okay, so there. So you can just see the, the the end just coming down to the end of the pocket there. So you just gotta make sure it's in all the way. So what's the purpose of those things? Uh, so this holds the, the ballast pouch. Uh, yeah. You've got a dedicated pocket that sits in here. Um, so you can pop extra ballast in there if you need to. And that clicks in at the top. Yeah, we'll do that so later. The, so the yeah. plates hold that off your lap. Yeah. Um, and again, it gives a bit more sort of structure to the harness. You can fly without it. Um, that's fine. Works straight. Um, but yeah, I tend to fly it with. Um, okay. And I tend to use this for keeping the instruments in as well. So uh, keep like snacks, sundries, spare glasses. Uh, laundry. Flight deck. Yeah. <laughs> Sandwiches. 
sandwiches, yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, but none of this is really accessible in flight because it's buried under yeah. the zips and under the instrument panel, and you know, it's all like deeply buried. But it's a nice bag to carry up the hill. Um, so again, you can put some of the weight in there. And you haven't got all the weight on your back. It helps you balance when you're, you're carrying the load. Um, so I don't fly with any extra ballast. Um, so the ballast bag, I literally just put loose sods and ends. So it's car keys, house keys, wallet, change. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Pack of tissues, hay fever season. Yeah, that all goes in there. We used to zip up the tail whereas now you just untuck the harness from the tail so then you've got your storage pouch in the back and then you can put your water bladder and your, your rucksack and things kind of directly in the back so they just slot straight in so that'll go in there and then there's a space to bring the water out so the water comes out through the pocket and it has to go under the reserve bridle and then it comes through the chest pocket on the harness uh, so there'll be a hole in here so it helps if you've got one of these walk pipes it's got a disconnectable tube so you can feed it in through through this way and again you've got to make sure you come under your reserve bridle got two bridles because you've got the beamer in this side So yeah, Osprey and Camelback. What Camelback is it you got? Uh, so this one's an Osprey. Uh, Osprey yeah. So Osprey's the company. Yeah. Um, and it's a two litre bag, but they do them in like one, two, three litre bags. Um, so yeah, I normally fly with two because it, it also fits in the weightless as well. But having that like kind of clippy hose connector system um, really makes a difference. And then Although it's the large bag, that actually fits really nicely in the back. And the other thing that I tend to put in the back is the uh, the fresh non-sweaty t-shirt for hiking out <laughs> afterwards. Top tip there. Yeah, if ever you're going to uh, try and blag a retrieve, you, you want a clean t-shirt, you want to smell nice. <laughs> Always have a choice of two fleeces, so I have a thick or a thin that I fly with. Um, I think today I'll fly with a thin fleece. Um, it's one of the things about flying in the harness because you're so cocooned in, it's, it's quite warm on the inside. Um, you can get quite sweaty quite quickly. I don't think there's going to be much issues about being cold at cloud base. So uh, looking forward to the winter season. <laughs> yeah, I've heard some pilots have said about these kind of harnesses all cocooned in, getting very hot. Yeah, um, I think the, from what I can gather, um, the, uh, the Genie race is a little less sensitive to that than some of the others. Um, I think it's to do with the material they use. It's, it's less like a paraglider fabric. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it allows uh, the, the heat to come through so much. Um, but obviously you are dangling out the sun the whole time. So yeah, yeah you are going to get toasty. Um, the concertina bag for the glider, um, I put that in my helmet bag. Um, and then that goes in the pouch under the seat. So, got the full face visor. Got what a mirror. That? Oh, that's the uh, Icaro Four Fight Grid Cut. Yeah, so um, don't do any more. So it's got the venting in the top, which I really like. So it's not too sweaty. Um, but yeah, got to have a mirror visor. It's the only way to climb out. <laughs> um, so yeah, so helmet bag. Constantina bag goes in there, and then that goes in the pocket under the seat. There's a, a little ballast pouch um, under the seat. And again, it's got these little straps, so if you put anything weighty in there, it stops it straining on the on the zip. But it, it is quite a small, it is quite a small pocket. I think in the manual it says five liters, but you'd be, um, you'd be pressed to get five liters under there. Something like that, it might even be three or four, isn't it? Something yeah, like um, I think if you're going to fly with a chunk of ballast, you put it in the, the pouch mm. and have that less under the seat and more up in the middle. But I like that it's got these these clips in underneath. So if you have got something heavy in there, then it then it holds it. 
So um, while we're in here, uh, we've got the speed bar line as well. Actually, just want to make a point there that you notice on Phil's pointing out with this harness, which is heavy duty built, and it's got these traps holding it. And then I'm always surprised. Um, I see pilots with ultralight pod harnesses that have a pocket underneath made out of an ultralight material and then they fill it up with a load of ballast and then they wonder why it gets damaged and the zip breaks. Yeah. So this is why, because if you do want to put ballast in, this is only a five litre pocket, then you need straps and things to hold it and heavy duty material. So, so yeah. that's why this, this kind of harness is made for this job, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's yeah. tools for the trade. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I fly with a weightless when I do my hike and fly stuff. And the only thing I put under there is the, the concertina bag and the helmet bag. Yeah. And it's just, a uh, you know, 500 grams of fluff and padding. Yeah. Do you know, it, there's nothing more substantial than that. Um, I've put a jet boil in underneath. <laughs> um, and, uh, but yeah, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to crash with that. Do you know, it's, um, yeah. you, you got to be thoughtful about what you're using and why. Um, yeah. And just cause it's there, that doesn't necessarily mean you can get away with using it. Yeah, so. good. What instrument are you flying with? Uh, so I've got an XC Tracer and I've got a Samsung Note 9. Um, and the only thing that that's ever used for is flying. It's not used for anything else. It doesn't have a SIM card. Connects to the phone through the, the Wi-Fi. So I, I hotspot my, my regular phone, um, but that goes in a bag wrapped up and tucked out of the way. And then I've got the, the Live BS. Um, so that, that works a treat. So we'll get all this on. How long have you had the Flymaster Live DS? Uh, 18 months, maybe two years. I was one of the first to get one. Um, so as a sort of early adopter with it, um, I like it. Um, it, it works a treat, um, could do with being louder. Um, but bizarrely that's less of an issue with the, the race harness. Um, you know, you, you're more streamlined, you get less draft. You know, you, you don't need noise. the instruments quite mm. so loud. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, I, I was very familiar with the, the live and then the live, um, SD. And so I've basically got my, my screen set up sort of almost exactly the same. And then the, the color map kind of replaces the phone, but I don't trust it entirely. So that's why I've still got the phone. Um, when I do comps, I almost exclusively rely on this. Um, when I'm just doing a Jolly About or an XC, I almost exclusively rely on the phone. So I, I tend to switch between the two. Why do you um, have the XC Tracer as well? Uh, so the XC Tracer is to send the information to the phone. Um, oh. And it's it, it was the first thing I had with the Flam. Because prior to this, I didn't have any, any kind of Flam. And I fly a lot around where, where sailplanes are. And so the idea of getting taken out by a sailplane coming out of cloud base at 90 knots with the air brakes out, and you know, I wanted to know that I'm there. Um, and again, the, the recent trip I had in the Alps, um, flying with the XC Tracer and having the Flam, um, you're able to see sailplanes coming the other way down the Araby. Um, you get a minute or two's warning that they're coming before they, they're on you. Um, it gives you half a chance to bank up and make sure that you're, you're visible. Mm -hmm. um, it's easier for them to avoid you than for you to avoid them. Um, but just making yourself visible and putting in a steep turn, you just present them a lot of wing area and then they can see you. Um, but if you've, if you've got something with Flam, um, either the, the DS, the Skytrax, the Pexy Tracers, anything with Fanit, anything that just makes you visible, it's just a way of being safer um, in the air. So um, there's a natty, yeah, so there's a, a natty little hole for the, the battery pack to go in and then you can bring the the lead up through um, so that sort of works out quite well goes in here and then the holes at the front just kind of under the the hook knife go for it stick it show us stick it in so yeah so thing in the hole and again you got like solid bit of velcro to smudge that up and again pull tabs so again you're not trying to unpeel stuff it's yeah. It's been thought about, and the, again, the hook knife in there, and again, the Velcro to keep it secure. Yeah, it's it's things like that. It's it's been thought about. So the reserves, uh, you got the same both sides. Um, so they're they're both in behind in the back panel. Uh, you've got handle secured by Velcro. It's easy to to get the handle. Um, and there's a, a release mechanism here and another release mechanism on the inside. Um, the zips, uh, one comes down and meets here, and the other one goes up and around the back and meets on the other side. Um, and then the bridles come out. You just have to make sure with your water tube that you run it under the bridle. Um, so when you're installing the, the water bladder in the back of the harness. Um, it's easy enough getting the reserves in. Uh, I've got a full-size beamer in one side and a full-size square reserve in the other. Um, 
So, you know, if I've got the height and the time, then I'll throw the steerable and have a choice about where I crash. Um, but I'm not <laughs> intending to get either of them out. <laughs> uh, so there's three adjustments around the, the lumbers. So I've just pulled in this one that's behind the skin um, a little bit, just to make myself sat up a little bit more upright. Um, I just kind of feel it's like really hard to, to look around. And so sitting up a little bit just makes it a little bit easier for the visibility. So I've just pulled the lumber in a little, a little go. Mm -hmm. And then uh, around the, the seat surface, um, just sort of the, the angle of the, the seat plate. Um, so this one's kind of all the way out. Um, so I'm just going to pull this in a smidge um, on both sides and then see if that, that helps. Um, so we're just going to do a little on both sides. Um, I had the briefest of hangs in the garage, um, but what I always find hanging in the garage is very different from flying because when you fly the the tension of the the harness um is, is very different across the chest strap and the interaction between the vertical straps and the horizontal straps is is different um the weightless was perfect in the garage but a nightmare in the air um and again this is this isn't so bad um but i find it like flying having a short flight landing adjusting flying landing adjusting it's always the the best way to do it um, so when you say the weightless was a nightmare in the air what do you mean to adjust uh, yeah, you, you can't adjust it in the air. That's what you mean. Um, so it's, yeah. it's not made to, you can't, it's not made yeah. to adjust in the air. No, you, you, like that, that's it. You know, but it, I, I thought it was right in the garage, um, and it, it turned out it wasn't. It needed a fair bit of fiddling with it. Show us about that, the connection, because it's directly rooted, isn't it? Yes. Um, I noticed they've sort of changed that slightly as well. Yeah. So, You've done it differently to the manual. Yeah, so better, up here... Much better, I think. Um, I've just put a, a lark's head with the the loop um, so in the manual they've got the loop on the speed bar and then you knot at this end and make adjustments whereas i've put the loop at this end run it through the pulleys run it through the harness and then all of my adjustment is down at the bag show that through so here my... so it goes along there phil's rooted it round that way and it goes through the thing you can see it's got 30 mil allen yeah. pulleys on there no racket it hasn't got there on to stand that chip please, yeah. Um, so then all my adjustment is at the harness end. Um, but it has these little markers that are evenly spaced, so it's really easy to make sure it's the, the same both sides. Um, so it, it took a bit of adjustment, but I'm, I reckon I'm pretty much there. So yeah, one or two short flights today and I reckon I'll be totally set. Um, and then I've got the rest of the summer um, before St. Andre in September. So cool. So yeah, so. I think this is a much better way to do it. Yeah. The way in the manual shows the other way around. And I think it's much you, better. You end I, up with excess strength. I can't it. understand actually why all the harness manufacturers don't always have it looped up or whether it's a Brummel hook or, a, or using a lark's head or connecting it directly like that. It's yeah. more about having the adjustment down here. So it's hidden away and, and down at this end rather than bits of string yeah. flapping about at that end. You've got to be careful with, um, if you do have an adjustment down here, you've got to be careful with like loops and excess knots and having things snag. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the sooner you can do away with those sort of Brummel connectors, the, the better, I think. Um, oh, I'm clearly fine. a Brummel hater. He's yeah. a Brummel hook hater. Not a fan. Not, Not a, fan. a fan. Are you Are you a Brummel hook hater? Are you one of those, oh, does, does Brummel hooks make you angry? Make a comment down below. Tell Maybe. us how angry you are about Maybe Brummel hooks. They fill me full of rage. Do they? Yeah, yeah, fill me full of rage. <laughs> like said in a proper knot. <laughs> Let the fast begin. Um, the main thing is to make sure the tail's over the top of the harness. Um, and then you can get one side up and through. Yeah, try and show that more clearly on this side. And then you have to find the shoulder strap and make sure you go under the shoulder strap before you then go up into the harness. Oh. Yeah, I've seen the hydration tube being causing an issue before. Let's get yeah. out of your way. Yeah. So that will come through. Now I reckon Phil's made that look quite easy. Yeah. Well, it's... I've had a bit of practice. Yeah. So the, the thing you, you notice initially is you've got a lot of sort of weight and force behind your neck and the whole thing makes you want to like kind of hunch down. So, and then the next thing is legs. Now normally I never, ever, ever talk while I'm clipping in. Okay. So it might stop and start. 
while I do this. Don't let me distract you. Um, but there's no get up or reminder on the the leg straps, and this is the only thing that holds you into the harness. Um, so you've got to, got to, got to make sure that you do this section um, before you do any of the rest of it. Okay. Um, so Phil's basically saying no get up. There's no anti oubli there's no forget me not system so there's no if you don't do up those leg straps you're falling out of the harness yeah basically. you will just slide straight yeah. through so there's um, no and i guess jim must have done that to make it simpler they just decided to do that for the level of pilot flying it um i think they just assume that yeah if you're at this level you're not going to make that mistake um and to be fair i, I never did with the race four um but I've, I've done it once with this um yeah. and it's yeah once is enough you, you never want to do that again yeah um the next piece that goes in uh, is your ballast container so you got these little straps that come off the top is that right right on. again yep okay so the smooth bit goes on the the inside oh yeah cool and then you've got little buckles that clip in on both sides and that's why you've got the, the plates. Because if this is chock full of water, I mean, you might be flying with seven or eight kilos of ballast. Um, mm. And yeah, if this is chock full of water, then you, you want something to take the weight and hold it off you. So again, they're, they're clips in all sides. And again, that's, that's easy to move. And there's space to get your feet up. You know, so when you're going for the bar, you know, it's, it's not going to get in your way. Um, that's why it's got the smooth fit and again it's reinforced with the straps so if you have got weight in there it's going to keep it contained um, the next piece then is doing the top zip and this one's a bit of a faff and a fiddle so it's easy enough getting it in through this first section but then it pulls quite tight and so you have to get this kind of together underneath and so the way to do it is to sort of kind of reach down through the middle and pull the zip down to pull the, the zip up. So I tend to save doing that up until I'm I'm like in the air and then I'll zip up the rest of the way because it can be quite claustrophobic at the top. And then your pod zip has to start from the top and go down. And that goes all the way down to a solid chunk at the end. Okay, and then you've got your, your bottom zip that you'll do in the air red one to pull it up. You can see the, the zip, the string. So the blue one will pull it up. Leg out that way. Yeah. So the red line goes down and then there for doing up the zip. Yep. zip. And then the white one will, will undo it. So as the red one comes up, this white line will disappear into the pod and then become tight. Cool. So, okay. So the last thing in the pre-flight is to get the instrument deck in. So that just punches in at the top, these fold over, and we've got these little sticks. Show us the little sticks. So they've got a handy bit of string, so you can pull them up and poke them through. And they pull the, the flight deck down and into place when you land, uh, sorry, when you take off and land. So when you land, you want the thing up. So it's not like kind of in your way and jab it in your belly. But when you're flying, it'll come down and it holds it at a, at a perfect angle. And that's the, the white strings that you saw that are attached to the pillars um, on the on the inside of the pod. All the time the flight deck's up, you can like kind of lean out the yeah. harness. Um, I think that's a great design because uh, quite a few harnesses have got that wrong. They kind of, you have the flight deck down and then when you launch they stop you leaning forward yeah. or you squash your instruments and things oh, that's like that. One of the things I liked about this one is having the, the instruments on the outside, they're not hidden behind a piece of plastic. You can touch them, you can do stuff with them, yeah, you can swipe the screens, um, you can push the buttons, you don't have to unzip to do stuff. So tail management, um, left to its own devices, this thing will be big, it'll be enormous. Um, so having a hand on it when you turn around is, is always good. Um, it's not too bad, this one. Um, but this is the, the windiest sort of conditions that I've, I've been up and out in so far. 
so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. Um, but yeah, um, kind of ready to launch and flake it out. Okay. That's great. Perfect. <laughs> Um, I've already undone the top zipper chunk for the, the landing, just to make it easier. But this comes all the way down. Um, flight deck comes up, and you can unzip all the way down through. You can actually take the flight deck out at this point. So you've got your sticks with your handy strings to pull them straight. So you can lose one through there. And then your other one, use your string to pull it straight, lose it through there. And then that just unfolds on your Velcro. So that's your instruments and then that's your top zip so that will disappear down through the middle and then you've got the upper section of the pod zip and that can undo as well and then you can see the last little bit of the, the top section and then you can easy see this bag so when it's just between flights i only unclip it on the one side if i'm packing up and going home i'll unclip the whole thing um, and then, yeah, then you get your chest straps. Squeeze both buckles. And then getting out the shoulders, the only way I think to do this easy is to shrug the whole thing off. Wait a second, I need you to turn around this way so I can okay. see this got some better for this bit. Yeah. So in terms of getting your arms out of the sleeves, because there's another hole on the inside that's tight, so the cone isn't tight, there's a tighter hole on the inside. So the only easy way to get this out is to shrug the whole thing off kind of in one hit. You've got to kind of wrestle out and then wrestle both arms out at the same time. Because when I tried this, I, I, when I was trying to get out of the harness, I was stuck. I couldn't get out, but that's a good trick. I did eventually, but that was a good tip. Yeah. So Phil, hey, you've been flying you a little while. Uh, yeah, 35 years this year. Um, April 89 I started. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's changed a bit, <laughs> that's for sure. And so you started in 89, and uh, what are paragliders like then? Uh, so we, we started out with Harleys and, uh, and some ITVs. Um, the first Harley wing I had was a, a thing called a New Wave, and it's rectangular. And then we had a thing called a Magic, and I had a little ducktail on the back. Um, and they, they made the, the bigger gliders by putting more cells in the centre, so the, the bigger gliders went better because they had a higher aspect ratio. And then uh, the first glider I owned had a, a Harley Free Spirit. And that was like the, the Falorc athlete. It had uh, battens in the nose to, to reinforce the glider. All the reinforcements were internal. Um, had sort of semi-closed cells at the tips. It was a two riser glider. Um, the, the brake line went through a ring on the riser. Uh, so yeah, so, so some things haven't changed. So back there, they had, they had rods and two liners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they had these like little battenish stick things about 18 inches long. So uh, you have to be yeah. careful how you packed it. So you, when did you get into start doing the competitions? Uh, so the comps came really sort of early. Um, I, I won the university championships in 91 qualified for the nationals that year and kind of finished in the middle of the table um, but the gliders were developing so quickly you had to buy a new glider every year and you know, I was just a broke student without any sponsorship so uh, it, it kind of got a bit frustrating um, but I, I sort of never really did that well at the, the comps initially um, and I, I stepped away from it all in the, the mid 90s um, and then took a, a break from the sport for a little bit uh, got married moved to London had the kids and then kind of got back into it sort of 2010 um, and that's that's when I got my Amiga um, started developing a fascination for the X Alps and looked at going back to comps and then my, my first proper comp back was the uh, the Nordic Open in 2012. Um, so I went out to Asia with a bunch of Danes and Swedes and Finns and uh, had a right old time of it and uh, discovered all the, the magic was back. 
how many how many hours of flights you got very roughly uh so ish roughly i'm probably on around sort of 1200 1250 hours um i still keep a logbook but i have to go back and check the total i'm like three quarters of the way down a page so i have gotta get to the end of the page and add it all up but i, I reckon i'll probably be on 1300 hours by the time i get to the end of the page um and then comps best place uh was 11th at the brits that was like 40 something overall um that was at uh Asia last year um so i'll be going out to san andre this year um best xc in the uk is probably around about 100k uh, but I've, I've always got to be home in time for tea um I, I can't just bugger off for like seven eight hours at a time i've always got to be back um so it's it's kind of limiting in that sense um but out in the alps i'll, I'll fly 100 150k as, a, as an fai or an out return um, but again i'm normally out with other people and you know someone's got to get back and get the car um, yeah. So why have you? Why did you get yourself to this kind of comp harness? Because you're obviously doing the comps. And yeah. What comps um, are you going to be doing this year? So I'm going to be at the British Open in uh, San Andre later this year. Um, so this year I'm doing one trip, one comp. Uh, if the comp goes well, the next year I'll be doing two comps and then trying to qualify for PWC. Um, but if you're going to go and play in that environment, then the you know everything matters. Everything matters. Um, you can go you know 20 places back in the field on the space of a glide. Um, so yeah, if you if you're not on kit that's set up right, trimmed, correct, um, and it's that that hundred meters height difference, that two minute distance, you do that five times over in the course of a flight, and then all of a sudden you're you know, you're ten minutes behind, you're you're a kilometer down track, you know you're five hundred meters difference in height, you're just in a yeah, you, you can't stay at the front if you're not in this kind of kit. So if I'm going to pursue the comps and if I'm going to try and qualify for the P, PWC, I've got to fly this kind of kit eventually. And uh, the, the timing was right to, to change. So what made you go for the GD Race 5? Um, I like the material it was made from. Um, the, the pod, it's just more sort of kind of durable, more heavyweight. Um, I think it's built to, to last, not built to get replaced. Um, so the, there was that, um, and I really like the way the, the zip worked with it, that you could um, zip it up and undo it. So you can undo it for a top landing, decide that actually you're going to go around again, change mind, climb out. It's easy to, to do the zip back up. Um, so yeah, so and again, so yeah, just familiar with the, the gin kit and the gin harness, and I, I knew the size would be right. I didn't have any of those sort of wobbles about sort of, oh, am I getting the, the medium, am I getting the large? I knew the large GR4 fit. I kind of knew the large GR5 would fit like right off the bat, and, um, and it and it pretty much does. Um, so it's it's been an easy transition to, to make. I figured that'd be just an easier thing. Uh, like I said the the gin stuff's well made. It's well thought out. Um, I was very impressed with how durable the, the four was and how good it looked after the the, the time that I'd had it. Um, so yeah, yeah, brand loyalty, I guess. You said how many, how many hours did you fly the Genie Race for? Uh, I think it was around about 300 in the end. So I, again, I'd have to look at the log to be specific, but yeah. It's a good idea. So but yeah, I, I, I had a fair old chunk of use with it. So. Yeah. And then which other options did you look at? Uh, so I looked at the submarine from Ozone. Uh, and at the time when I was trying to make decisions, they were talking about the second skin, but they hadn't released the second version of the skin. Um, and I knew there were issues with the first one. And I knew the, the large size was a little bit sort of tricky for, for some people um, and the the medium size was was sorted but I'm very much not not a medium pilot I'm a medium weight but I've got very long legs and I, I don't fit normal things what's your height uh, I'm a little over six foot um, but I've got a 36 inch inside leg um, which is just yeah freakishly monstrous <laughs> um, yeah I'm, I'm like a baby giraffe sometimes you know, I'm trying to move around um, so yeah so I, I don't sort of fit things in a sort of kind of conventional sense um, I, I had this with the Cortels the Cortels are lovely harness around the back but I, I just couldn't make the pod fit when I was looking at the, the cannibal races um, and then so but going for the, the Gini race 4 that fits so well I just figured the five is just gonna be a really sort of smooth and easy transition um, and so the, the zip and unzip thing, you can do the zips both ways anytime you like. Um, I, I really like that about the, the gym. Um, the Niviac didn't have the, the inflatable front, it only had the inflatable rear. Um, and I wasn't sure about the back protection, whereas I knew about the coiroid, and I'm, I'm happy with the, the, the straws in there. I'm happy with how that, that works and the, the kind of protection that, that offers. Um, the size and the shape of the protectors are the, the same as the Genie Race 4. Um, yeah, I figured the harness would be, be fine. 
and it's it's only really for getting you know plucked and dumped. Um, you know, it's 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 not really there to be you know smashed into the ground from great height. Um, I think if you're going to have a big accident, then you want to be going in under reserves and having the the two reserves in the back. That's that's a nice nice neat sort of trick. And the, the way the reserves open and come out. Um, again, it's it's been really well engineered and really well thought out. Um, it, it's clear just from looking at the harness and setting it up that they've put a lot of work into to making it good. It's, it's intuitive to fly. Um, the, the weight shift's good. The way it reacts and turns with the glider is good. Um, you can see me sort of swinging it around and turning and stuff. You know, and it's it it's perfectly fine in the in the air. Um, the visibility is is kind of reduced compared to what you might be be used to. Um, the the way the the head and the cockpit are related. Uh, you really can't see over that to, to your feet. You've really got to sit up to see your feet. Um, but the whole thing should be streamlined anyway. Um, so it's it it's different, but it's but it's not unmanageable. Um, you know, it it, it works. Um, it works really well, I think. How's the weight shift compared to the Junior Race Four? Uh, weight shift's great. Um, the Junior Race Four was very adjustable, but I I never adjusted it. I had it set and I liked it. And this is very very similar. It's a very similar feel. Um, but to be fair, I mean, I put the, the Junior Race 4 back in the bag in, until September when I got back from the Brits. Who's it for? Um, I think it's for pilots who are going to spend some time on the bar. Um, yeah, if you're going to push into wind, um, if you're going to race, um, then, then yeah, that, that's where the advantage is, is going to lie, because it's going to give you that extra point to glide. And that marginal gain matters in marginal conditions. You come out on a windy day, and the, the guy who's got an extra point to glide, that, that will really show up. Yeah, you because know, the difference between two and three is, is half as much again. Whereas the difference between, you know, 19 and 20 when you're floating downwind um, isn't so much. Um, so if, you, if you're going to fly where it's windy, you're going to fly on the bar, you're going to push into wind, you're going to do any kind of racing. Yeah, you know, if your performance really matters, um, so if you're looking at going to the SRS or you're looking at going to the the opens and the, the cat twos and maybe the PWC, so, you know that that's the kind of pilot that's that's going to get this. I, I don't see your average everyday weekend pilot getting something like this. I think they're they're probably better off with just like a, a regular pod, yeah, maybe with a tail. Um, so you know, it's but it, it's it's horses for course. It depends what what makes you happy. Um, I mean, some pilots would appreciate like the weight, the bulk, the two reserves, the extra security, and they they don't mind carrying that extra weight because it helps them fit in the weight range on a on a bigger size glider, maybe. Um, so again, that that kind of thing can help. Um, but but again, I, I don't see it being like your your average club pilot harness. So I I don't see the, there's going to be much benefit for your average club pilot. Really, if somebody's deciding, you know, it's trying to decide, oh, I'm not sure about whether they go for this harness, what's the, really the deciding factor for this kind of harness? Yeah. This, I, like, full torpedo shape but with a big fairing. Yeah, I, the deciding I think you're cross-country racing. I think, yeah, general cross-country is a maybe, but cross-country racing, it's it's absolute. Um, and again, if you're serious about a result, then you, you, you're only going to wind up getting beat by people who've got them. Um, and it's the only bit of kit that you haven't changed and you'll, you'll wind up changing it. Uh, but I think your, your average cross-country pilot, your, your float down wind um, cross-country pilot, they won't want the weight, they won't want the bulk, they won't want the aggravation, they won't want to live with the, the consequences of, of owning something like this. Because um, it, it is a, a faff on the ground. I mean, it's lovely in the air, but it's, yeah, you try and take this on a bus or a train. Um, yeah, the, the bag is enormous. There's no way of making it small. It's not easy to manage. You know, the, the next step from this is having a hang glider. Um, you know, it's... When you've been flying before, you had the Junior Race 4, and you were flying against pilots who were in subs and other harnesses like this. Yeah. Um, have you got, well, what's the difference that you've seen? Um, it, it's generally a couple of minutes and 100 metres on more or less every high-speed glide. Um, so if, if you're just tentatively finding your way, um, then it's it's not so bad. Um, but the, the minute people start pushing beyond half bar um, and start actively going places, um, they, they will just subtly, smoothly creep away. Um, and it's like somebody being consistently in better air. Um, it, it's not a night and day. Um, 
but it is hard to catch up. Once they're above and ahead, it's, it's, it's hard to catch up. Um, and that's what the, the harnesses do. They just get you to a position where you just float to being above and ahead. Um, you just meander up and out. What's the pilot going to feel the difference between like a standard pod harness? Let's not go to the ultralight, yeah. but like a standard pod harness compared to a, a full comp. Um, it just stops all the sort of snaky wobbliness. Um, the, the, the harness will follow the glider much more, so you don't get that disassociation between pod and harness. Um, so when the, the glider turns, the, 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 the airflow will turn, the pod will turn, like everything's just kind of much more coordinated. Um, so I think on a standard pod harness, it's easier to get kind of out of shape. Um, mm -hmm. And you have to pay more attention to yeah how you yaw the pod. Uh, if you just hang in a pod in the garage and then just push your feet on the, the plates, you can swing your feet from one side to the other. And there's that maintenance and balance in the turn and keeping turns coordinated. And everything's just a little bit easier with the, the long tail. Everything just seems to just flow. Because uh, they're a lot more rigid, aren't they, lengthways? They've got a lot of rigidity and... Yes, tension. yeah, there's a, a big mylar plate that runs through the, the bottom of, of this. Um, and that keeps the whole thing sort of fairly stiff. And again, where the tail's so long, there's a lot of leverage. So you don't need a lot of force at the back of the tail to, to keep the thing straight. Um, it's probably half as much again, if not double the length of the, the Genie Race 4 pod. Um, the, the Genie Race 4 tail was, was quite big already, but this, this is huge by comparison. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely massive. Um, but then you, you see that in the air-to-air -air shots. You see the, the length of leg in front of the carabiner, and then you see the, the length of tail behind the carabiners. Um, yeah, you, you realise just how much bigger these things are. Right, see you in a moment. Woohoo! <laughs>